Why, hello there. Just got off the train? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Walla Walla citizens. Some of our citizens are farmers. Hard-working people. Then there's the upper crust. There are a lot of fancy mansions here in Walla Walla. They do a lot to financially support Walla Walla. They're helping to make our city grow. Then there's those citizens who frequent our saloons. Many of our citizens are of Chinese ancestors. Today's issue of the Walla Walla Gazette is July 27th, 1895. Water War On, City of Walla Walla versus the Water Company again, to be heard in court. On Tuesday at 2 o'clock p.m., a special meeting of the City Council was called. A secret session of the members present, Betts, Lambert, Evans, Mason, and Mayor Roberts was held, which to outsiders meant that the water question was under discussion. City Attorney Double gave his opinion that the contract between the water company and the city had been broken and that the proper remedy would be another suit. A vote to the motion to whether the water company should be brought suit against was passed. The complaint opens with a copy of the ordinance and contracts and goes on to allege that since the execution of the contract, the inhabitants of the city and the consumers of water have increased about 4,000, and that the only source of supply of water for the use of the inhabitants is that furnished by the Walla Walla Water Company. That notwithstanding the increase in population, the water company has failed and refuses to increase the supply of water proportionate to the increase in consumption, or at all, and that by reason of their refusal and neglect so to do the water supply is wholly inadequate to the reasonable demands of the inhabitants. The complaint further avers that the plaintiff has been without sufficient water to flush the city sewers, and for this reason the city has been prevented from constructing and maintaining sewers, though they are necessary for the health and comfort of the inhabitants. Continuing, it is alleged that the supply of water for fire purposes is wholly inadequate and compels the city to maintain expensive fire apparatus and that by reason of the inadequacy of the water supply, the city is in great danger and peril. It is also alleged that the company has been and now is conducting into its reservoirs impure, unwholesome and polluted water that the company demands and is receiving an exorbitant price for the use of the water, that the former action against the water company is now pending in the Supreme Court and will not be decided for three years, and that during that time intolerable hardship and irreparable injury will result if the contract is not avoided by decree of court. 
H.T. Harbert is as proud as a knight. He has won another fair admirer. She was first in his arms Wednesday, and Mrs. Harbert is not jealous. Mr. and Mrs. W.F. Myers have a daughter added to their household. She warbled her first love notes Wednesday. The society people are making up a party to attend the circus next Tuesday. As many of the young men are away in the mountains, and as those who are too busy to rusticate are also too much occupied to go to a show, the maids and matrons threaten to pay their way and then be independent. Does that mean to flirt with the equestrians? Thomas Eastman, H.A. Gardner, and Guy Turner returned from the Powder River Mountains this week. They are bronzed like Arabian horsemen and carry a good stock of stories under their turbans. They found great fishing in Trout Lake near Cornucopia, Oregon. Harry and Will Howard led them to this beautiful body of water. The Howard boys are now mining in this vicinity. Richard McLean, Arthur Evers, and Miles Kiger returned Monday from an exploration of the Blue and Eagle Creek Mountains. They had excellent fishing and hunting and took on a healthy color. They report the Dayton Trail across the Blue Mountains to be in good condition. It starts at Thayer's Mill on the Tushi. The only Walla Wallens they encountered were Harry Fritzman and H.M. Rogers. S. Arwood, a man well known in the neighborhood of Milton, where he lives, was in Walla Walla Monday. On his way back home, he was overcome by heat. Mrs. William H. Stein and Mrs. Herbert Gregg are rusticating on Upper Mill Creek. W. H. Kirkman took a supply of campfire stories to the mountains Thursday. J. M. Hill and family have a camp of their own on Lincoln Mountain. It is called the Hill Camp and it is on a hill. Mrs. J. H. Marshall has led her sons to the Teal Springs, where they will drink pure Mountain Dew for a month. Riley D. Shonkweller and Miss Agnes Long were united in marriage Wednesday at the Methodist Parsonage by Rev. V. C. Evers. The bride is a handsome young lady who has gathered about her a large circle of friends during her residence in Walla Walla. Mr. Shonkweiler has helped to make the state restaurant the resort for those who seek expert catering. An Old Warrior The old timers of Walla Walla retain a vivid recollection of the events of the Indian War of 1877. While there was no immediate danger to the settlements in this valley, there existed about as intense excitement as though there had been. A number of our citizens had stock interests in Chief Joseph's country. So interested was Walla Walla in the suppression of Chief Joseph's rebellion that a company of volunteers was organized and sent out to assist the regulars in the campaign against the Indians. These volunteers paid their own expenses and furnished their own horses. Chief Joseph, the organizer of the rebellion, called at the Lewiston Tribune office recently. Colonel Ed Conville was with him and acted as interpreter. The editor of the Tribune writes the following as a result of that visit. Chief Joseph visited Lewiston Saturday for the first time since the unpleasantness of 1877 in which he was the moving and responsible genius. During that little excitement, Joseph headed the Nez Perce warriors on one side and on the other, Ed McConville commanded the volunteers and was practically governor of the state at the same time. Saturday, Joseph and Colonel McConville called together on the Tribune, they having since become firm friends and admirers. Joseph is the hereditary and sovereign chief of the Nez Perce Indians. In 1877, Joseph, then a fiery and impulsive lad of 22 or 23, had arranged with the government to occupy the Wallowa country across Snake River from Lewiston. 
but General Miles insisted on herding them in a smaller compass, and Joseph took to the warpath. His campaign through Nez Perce and Idaho countries is still a fresh event to many inhabitants. Joseph had 250 warriors, and the federal government undertook his capture with General Howard and 1,000 regulars. Joseph constantly eluded and puzzled Howard until finally the soldiers captured and killed 3,000 horses that were the Indians' main hope, and the war was practically over. Indians can neither fight nor run on foot. So Joseph came in and gave himself up. Joseph is now fat and bulky and uncommunicative, except in the vernacular, which he handles with ease and volubility. His followers, instead of being banished to Yellowstone Park, were simply given red blankets, improved rifles, and the Nez Perce lands, which the government has recently purchased back from them and which the whites will soon be scrambling over. The volunteers who protected homes and families from the raids of Joseph's band still have their claims pending settlement before the Congress of the United States. Joseph will remain in camp near the Lapwai Industrial School for a few days longer, or as long as the races last, before returning to the Colville Reservation. He is very anxious for Colonel McConville to return with him and take charge of the school there. The Goldendale Centennial speaks of the Walla Walla Gazette as a newsy little paper now in its second year of indefinite political proclivities. That's right, Brother Sentinel. Neither the politicians nor the newspapers know where or when to count us. The Gazette is freelance. The Schwabacher Company Believing that decreasing prices, where there are large numbers of customers, will better serve the public and better profit any business, we will hereafter conduct this establishment on the high quality and low price plan. We have been steady lowering prices and will continue to do so as long as our patronage continues to increase as at present. For example, today in groceries, San Francisco sugar 17, 18, and 20 pounds, $1. Dried fruit, all kinds, 20 pounds, $1. Home industry soap, 10 bars, 25 cents. Good beans for 22 pounds, $1. Good tea, 1 pound, 25 cents. Fresh table butter, 2 pounds, 30 cents. All kinds of farm produce taken in exchange. The smoke of peace wafts a mixed population into lots of trouble. Two doors from the post office on Alder Street, there is a house that has been frequented by both whites and Chinese for some time. Added to the variety of races was the differentiation of sex in the visitors in this place. The character of the persons passing in and out and the hours they kept created suspicions in the minds of the police. A raid was planned. On Wednesday morning, about 2 o'clock, officers McDole and Gustin surprised the occupants of the place by breaking in a side door. In a small room, they found a Chinaman, Lu Bo U, and two whites, Charles and May Edwards. The whites said they had recently come from Portland. If released, they would be pleased to return thither. Bowls, pipes, and all the paraphernalia for smoking opium were there in the rooms, and they looked as though they had been recently used. The parties were put under arrest. At the trial before Justice Nixon Thursday, the Edwards and Chinese outfit were very conservative. After hearing the evidence, Justice Nixon fined the defendants each $45. The whites went to jail to serve out the fine. The Chinaman, Lu Bo U, gave bonds to the amount of $100 and appealed his case to the Superior Court. The law provides that if persons are found in the presence of opium with implements for smoking, they may be punished. Campers who are troubled with mosquitoes may find relief by adding a few drops of carbolic acid to the water in which they wash their faces and hands. A. L. Lawrenson will occupy half of a new building on the south side of Main Street between 2nd and 3rd. 
The Chicago store will occupy the other part. After August 1st, the water company will make no collections outside of the office, and in case consumers do not pay their water tax before the 15th of each month, the water will be turned off, and a charge of 50 cents will be made for turning it on again. The Oregon Railway and Navigation Company is digging a large supply well at Starbuck, which is 14 feet in diameter. And the other day, the superintendent concluded he would facilitate the digging a little by using giant powder. He used six sticks, when one half a stick would have been sufficient. And the result was that a big explosion took place, blowing the casting of the well to pieces, shaking the buildings in town, and throwing gravel clean up over the shops. Luckily, no one was injured.